Weather. This is Al24 News live from Algiers, coming up next in our news program. Twelve cabinet ministers have submitted their resignation to newly reinstated Sudanese Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdouk in protest against a political deal between the Prime Minister and the country's ruling military council. Plus. Is the world witnessing what we can call as a fourth wave of COVID-19? Dr. Ali Al-Hajj answers this question in our news file. And finally, in a statement by Chinese Foreign Affairs spokesperson, Beijing condemns U.S. guided missile destroyer sailing through Taiwan Strait today, Tuesday. Hello again and welcome and we start our news bulletin with this piece of information and according to diplomats announced the sudden resignation of the United Nations envoy to Libya, Jan Kobis. The UN envoy to Libya had confirmed that all mercenaries and foreign fighters must leave Libya in accordance with United Nations resolution. And a bus carrying 52 people traveling from Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, to the country's southwest when it crashed and caught fire, causing the death of 45 people. Children were among the victims. Seven people with burns and wounds were rushed to the hospital in Sofia. According to the officials, the seven injured people in the crash were being treated and they are in a stable state. A ferry capsized off the coast of East Sri Lanka resulted in the death of at least six people, including four children. The ferry was traveling to the town of Kenya along Sri Lanka's eastern coast at the time of the accident. Zahra Farjani reports. At least six people have been killed in a ferry capsized in eastern Sri Lanka on Tuesday. Twelve people more have been rescued and the search for others is continuing. A Navy spokesman said it wasn't immediately clear how many people were on board the ferry or what caused it to overturn. Four children were among the dead, according to a policeman and a hospital worker, who spoke on condition of anonymity because they weren't authorized to talk to the media. The ferry was traveling from Korinchakini to the town of Kenya, along the country's eastern coast and about 260 kilometers northeast of the capital, Colombo. It was carrying mostly students and teachers to a school across a lagoon when it capsized. Ferry accidents are relatively rare in Sri Lanka because many locations are now connected by bridges. However, the bridge that connects the two towns has been closed for repairs, forcing people to use basic vessels to cross the river. Angry residents burned tires and surrounded government offices, blaming officials for the accident. Pictures show police and members of the Navy at the scene, with crowds of people standing on the shoreline. Always with the same country, Sri Lanka has started the first three trials related to the suicide bombing in 2019 that resulted in the death of nearly 270 people. The suspects were brought under heavy guards from different prisons by the police to the Colombo High Court during this morning. Let's follow this report. The series of attacks which occurred on Easter Sunday, April 21, 2019, Targeted three churches, three hotels, resulted in the death of nearly 270 people. It also included 45 foreign nationals. The tragic attack was deemed as the worst incident in Sri Lankan's turbulent history. A number of Catholic members gathered for a protest to show their support towards the survivors and to ensure the trials are allowed to proceed without any political interference. The court has listed a total of 1,250 witnesses to provide evidence, while a total of 255 charges of murder and attempted murder were read out by the court, confronting the police chief, Jaya Sandora. On the other hand, the court also called the top officials of the Defense Ministry and ex-Defense Secretary, Hamaziri Fernando, who will be facing similar charges of negligence, but his lawyer has not reached out to the court yet. According to the Sri Lankan government officials, all the eight of the suicide bombers were Sri Lankan citizens who were associated with National Tawhid Jamaat. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed announced his joining the front today, Tuesday, to lead the armed forces against the rebels of the Tigray Liberation Front at a time when the battles are getting closer and closer to the capital, Addis Ababa. The living conditions of the population deteriorated due to the lack of material assistance. Zahra Farjani again. 
The Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed joins his soldiers who are fighting the rebels and overthrowing the regional authorities deriving from the Tigray People's Liberation Front after he accused the regional forces of attacking army posts at a time when the battles are getting closer and closer to Addis Ababa. Ethiopian media suggested that the city of Deberbarhan, about 130 kilometers from the capital, would fall in front of the Tigray Liberation Front forces in the coming hours, while the authorities said that the rebels' military advances and imminent threat to Addis Ababa were exaggerated. The number of allied groups against the government forces reached nine, all aimed at stopping Abiy Ahmed, who called on the residents of Addis Ababa to organize their ranks and prepare to defend their city. In light of growing fears of the progress of the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front fighters and their allies towards the capital, the U.S. envoy to the Horn of Africa and his African counterpart, former Nigerian president, are making unremitting efforts in an attempt to reach a ceasefire, stopping the war that killed thousands and displaced more than two million people. The U.S. military has positioned U.S. Special Operations Forces in Djibouti to be ready to provide assistance to the U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia if the situation worsens, according to one military official and two sources familiar with the movements. As many as 12 ministers resigned from Sudanese Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdouk's cabinet as an objection to a political deal between the Premier and the head of Sudan's ruling military council, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan. The reinstatement between army and political leader was done to put an end to a weeks-long crisis that threatened Sudan's political transition. Let's follow this report. Hamdok was reinstated on Sunday after signing a political accord with Sudan's ruling military council's president, Abdul Fatih al-Burhan, to put an end to weeks-long crisis that jeopardized Sudan's political transition. According to a statement, the resigned ministers include those in charge of foreign affairs, justice, agriculture, irrigation, investment and energy. Ministers of higher education, labor, transportation, health, youth and religious affairs all resigned. The five ministers from the Forces of Freedom and Change Coalition, which had shared power with the military right before the military takeover last month, were unable to attend Monday's cabinet meeting. The ministers did not give a clarification for their resignation. They were part of a Hamdok-led transitional administration that was dissolved by Al-Burhan on October 25th. In the face of opposing protests and charges from the military and lawmakers, Al-Burhan imposed a state of emergency and sacked the transitional administration. Many have been killed since the October 25th military takeover in the middle of protests calling for a civil government. Venezuela's National Electoral Council awarded victory to the governing Socialist Party in 18 governorships. In a report following local and regional elections on Monday, President Nicolas Maduro celebrated the government's victory shortly after the initial results were released. As for the Venezuelan opposition that participated for the first time in a vote since 2017 after it had previously boycotted the presidential and legislative elections, it won the local elections in three states expressing reservations and considering that the late closing of polling stations may have led to fraud. Belarusian government announced the repatriation of 118 Middle Eastern nationals and more is to be sent today, Tuesday. However, difficulty in communication is the barrier between the EU leaders and the Belarusian Foreign Affairs Ministry, while migrants are still living the suffrage on the border. Ayadi Osama. Belarusian Interior Ministry announced the repatriation of 118 Middle Eastern migrants from its territories and more will be sent to the motherlands on Tuesday. In parallel with this last declaration of officials in Belarus, the European Union accused the latter of bringing thousands of migrants in and pushing them in the bloc to break through Europe via Lithuanian and Latvian borders. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko stated that the EU refused to discuss the fate of 2,000 migrants and didn't show any help for the stuck Middle Eastern nationals. And European leaders refused any contact despite calls from Belarusian foreign minister. According to German government spokesman Stefan Seibert, the possibility of a humanitarian corridor to Germany for 2,000 migrants is not acceptable neither for Germany nor for the EU. And he added that Lukashenko engineered this international crisis as a revenge for the sanctions imposed by the European Union after the brutal suppression of Lukashenko's regime on protests against his rule.
Migrants say they want to access European territories through Polish borders. And Lukashenko stated that his government is ready to do that, even if he has to devote airplanes for the process. However, it is more complicated for the European Union, as the latter insists on not giving permissions for the migrants to access their territories. AstraZeneca will see COVID job profits starting from next year. The company defended its decision to start making profits from its COVID-19 vaccine, saying that the countries with low purchasing power will be spared. Nabil Khazini reports. AstraZeneca announced it would move from previous commitments to sell the shots of a non-for-profit basis during the pandemic to modest profitability for sales of its COVID-19 vaccine. More than a billion doses of the jab have so far been released around the world by AstraZeneca and its partners, but until now they have been sold at cost, giving the vaccine a price tag of around $4 per shot. The Anglo-Swiss pharmaceutical company had said its COVID-19 vaccine contributed $275 million but cut little of its earnings. That will result in the company seeking to achieve a modest profit in the future from the vaccine in order to fund its new antiviral COVID treatment. The company's decision to begin seeking profit from its COVID vaccine is unlikely to begin until next year, as it still had many doses of the vaccine to supply that it had promised to do so at cost. The move from AstraZeneca comes amid poor countries are struggling to provide anti-corona jabs for their citizens. However, AstraZeneca said the jab, which it developed alongside the University of Oxford, will still be supplied to poorer nations on a not-for-profit basis, and profits will be used to substitute costs from its COVID antibody treatment. Austria has returned to a full national lockdown as protests against new restrictions aimed at curbing COVID-19 infections spread across Europe. From midnight, two uh, Austrians have been asked to work from home and non-essential shops have closed. Ayadi Usama again. Austrian government succeeded relatively to reconfine its population and a desperate try to decrease the spiraling number of COVID-19 cases in the country. This action took place starting from Monday, as citizens are under the obligation of staying home with severe restrictions by the forces, which doesn't permit the people to go out except for necessary activities, including shopping for groceries or going to the doctor. This lockdown was imposed as the average number of deaths is hiking, and hospitals warned that their intensive care units are reaching capacity. The quarantine will last 10 days, with a possibility of extension that can reach 20 days. Austrian Chancellor Alexander Schallenberg announced last week that there would be a mandate for vaccination. However, he didn't give any further explanation on how the mandate will work. But the government stated that the citizens who do not abide by the vaccination rules will face fines. The rate of infections in Austria is rising very rapidly, and vaccination rates are insufficient for the Western European nation to hold off the winter wave. However, the country witnessed fierce protest and the city of Vienna in refusal of the vaccination on Saturday. According to U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the current seven-day average of COVID-19 cases in the United States rose 18 percent from last week's average to 92,800 per day. However, the United States is not willing to impose a lockdown or shut down its economy to curb the spread of COVID-19 Yet, it is going to rely on other tools. U.S. regulators expanded eligibility for booster shots of COVID-19 vaccines to all adults on Friday. While countries in Africa remain far behind in the vaccination process, as most African countries still rely on supplies from overseas, despite efforts to take initiatives to produce jobs locally. Nabil Khazidi reports. As countries around the world hit COVID vaccine milestones, many African nations remain worryingly behind in their initial plans to provide jabs for their citizens. Africa has so far largely relied on supplies from overseas, as most of the vaccines that have reached the continent have come via Vaccines Global Access Initiative, or also known as COVAX Initiative, or through donations. African countries have now a production line with the capacity to produce 50 million COVID vaccine doses per year, a goal set to develop vaccines with African Union member states and secure sustainable vaccine production capacities, a step that will also improve overall medical care in Africa. 
Moderna, for instance, has confirmed that Rwanda, Senegal and South Africa could all be potential sites for the planned vaccine factory in Africa. It is true that there is a huge shortage of doses in Africa. The biggest challenge remains actually in vaccinating people. As a result, thousands of vaccine doses have been destroyed in African countries because they have exceeded their expiry dates. Others are being returned by countries saying they will be enabled to use them. Countries like Malawi destroyed almost 20,000 doses and South Sudan announced it would destroy around 60,000 doses. The reason is that many countries failed to prepare adequately before receiving the vaccines. Africa is in a very tough spot when it comes to supply and many factors are leading to delays including a lack of funds and trained professionals and hesitancy among the population to get the vaccine. All are holding back the rollout. And to talk more about the latest insights around the world concerning COVID-19, especially in Europe, regarding tightening lockdown measures, I'm joined live via Skype by Dr. Mohamed al Haja Ali, lecturer and principal investigator in immunology at Cardiff University School of Medicine from the UK. First of all, Dr. Mohamed, can we say that Europe and probably the whole world is witnessing what we can call as a fourth wave of coronavirus? Uh, good evening. Certainly there's another wave now, which is a big wave hitting Europe. And we can see an increase in the cases across the continent here, with an increase in the death toll as well, as been witnessed and as been declared by WHO last week, when they say that the death numbers and the death rate increased by 5%, and that put Europe as the only continent where we could see an increase in the death rate. So certainly there's another wave, and this wave coming now within the season of winter, and uh, without having like strict measures and dealing with that one properly, we're gonna see an increase in the death rate as well. Dr. Mohammed, wasn't it enough to curb the virus by vaccinating people of all ages? It is important certainly to put that one as one of the strategies here, curbing the trend and the spike of the virus by having um, a good vaccination rate and good vaccination campaigns to reach about 70 to 80 percent of the overall population. And that will achieve what we call it like herd immunity. It is important. However, in parallel to that one, there should be other measures as well, such as going to the lockdown if this is needed, um, either like a full lockdown or like a partial lockdown, especially as we see now in some countries in Europe with, with the massive increase in the cases. Uh, there are other measures as well, such as limiting the access to some public services. Um, all important actually to put together to control any rise or any expected rise in both cases and death. Here, Dr. Mohammed, why are people refusing the new lockdown measures being imposed on them, which turned violent in some places, including Europe and Australia, while we have seen uh, lots of cooperation from their part in the beginning of the spread of the virus? So that's correct. At the beginning, people would cooperate. Uh, however, the vaccination rates actually not being high enough to control what happened um, and what we see now in, in Europe. Um, some people will put it down to this is like their individual choice or this is their own liberty in a way, and this is their choice to be vaccinated or not vaccinated. However, there should be more work towards public awareness campaigns, that the vaccinations are safe, vaccinations are needed, and without reaching the herd immunity by vaccinating 70 to 80% of the overall, overall population, that means the COVID-19 pandemic will be prolonged for a long time. So I think it's to do with the efforts from like the health authorities there that we need more awareness to the public. Uh, and here, uh, taking into consideration the high rates that you have just talked about, about of corona cases in Europe and even in Australia, is this going to affect the number of vaccines sent to African poor countries? 
uh, it, it may have an impact actually, especially when we talk about like the production and um, the capacity of production and also the availability and the access to these vaccines. Um, however, I would say, um, I mean, this generally speaking, that the vaccines recommended in Europe slightly different from those uh, being recommended and offered and given to Africa. So the majority of the African countries, they rely on vaccines from either Chinese or Russian sources, whereas in Europe, they um, rely on different other sources as well. If you look at Europe in general, the picture there, it varies from West to East. In West Europe, we have like 60% of the population being vaccinated, immunized, um, against COVID-19. If you go to the eastern part of Europe, it's only 30%, which means half of the population which been vaccinated or half of the rate which been vaccinated in West Europe. So that like different picture in Europe. So should be always um, under the microscope. So we can't say like Europe is one Europe in a way when we talk about like the figures and the rates. So we have to look at the figures always in details and we have to distinguish between like country and another country in regards to like the public measures, in regards to the um, speed of the vaccination campaigns, in regards to the rate as well of the population which being vaccinated. And finally, as a doctor who is working at the front lines in the fight of the virus, when are we likely to have a life free from corona, uh, providing like people started to breathe at least when vaccines started to be available? I think, I mean, 2022 will be the start of the end of this pandemic. Hopefully by the end of next year, we're going to see the world um, getting out completely of this pandemic. We have to adapt to coronavirus. It will be one of the viruses we have to live with, but hopefully with enough vaccination, with enough awareness, with enough treatments as well for those who are being affected by COVID-19, we will be able to overcome this. As a doctor working in the UK and as a researcher based in the UK as well, I can say that the picture this year, it's much more better compared with last year when we were hit badly with COVID-19 in UK as Europe and the rest of the world. So hopefully by achieving high rates of vaccinating the population in any country in the world, you're going to be um, overcoming the pandemic by reaching what we call it the herd immunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed al Haja Ali, lecturer and principal investigator in immunology at Cardiff University School of Medicine. You joined us live via Skype from the United Kingdom. And Beijing condemns U.S. guided missile destroyer sailing through Taiwan Strait today, Tuesday, in a statement by Chinese Foreign Affairs spokesperson. U.S. responded, stating that the destroyer sailed in international waters in accordance with international law. Hussein Berken reports. Beijing condemned U.S. warships sailing through Taiwan Strait today, Tuesday, in a statement by Chinese Foreign Affairs spokesperson. Zhao Lijian added that China is firmly resolved in upholding national sovereignty and territorial integrity. The Chinese side was closely following and fully aware of the U.S. military vessel's passage through the Taiwan Strait. The U.S. warships have repeatedly flexed muscles, made provocations, and stirred up trouble in the Taiwan Strait in the name of freedom of navigation. This is by no means commitment to freedom and openness, but rather deliberate disruption and sabotage of regional peace and stability. The international community sees this plainly. China is firmly resolved in upholding national sovereignty and territorial integrity. The U.S. side should immediately correct its mistakes, stop making provocations, challenging the bottom line and playing with fire, and play a more constructive role in regional peace and stability. The U.S. Navy said a riot Berkey-class guided missile destroyer Melis conducted the routine Taiwan Strait transit through international water in accordance with international law, and that the ship's transit through the Taiwan Strait demonstrates the U.S. commitment to free and open Indo-Pacific. The United States military flies, sails, and operates anywhere international law allows. This comes a week after the virtual summit between the President of the United States, Joe Biden, and Xi Jinping, the President of People's Republic of China. As leaders of China and the United States. A driver fleeing from a domestic disturbance killed five people and injured more than 40, including two children in Wakusha, Wisconsin, yesterday Monday. Police said the driver will be charged with five counts of international homicide. Let's follow this report. 
a tragedy in Waukesha, Wisconsin, after at least five people were killed and more than 40 were injured, including two children, when a car crashed in a parade. Police Chief Dan Thompson said that Dara Brooks Jr., 39, was fleeing a domestic disturbance with a report of a knife when he crashed into the parade. Brooks was not being chased. Thompson said that the driver will be charged with five counts of intentional homicides. Through barricades into a crowd of people that was celebrating the Waukesha Christmas Parade, which resulted in killing five individuals and injuring 48 additional individuals. I just received information that uh, two of the 48 are children and they're in critical condition. We have information that the suspect prior to the incident was involved in a domestic disturbance, which was just minutes prior, and the suspect left that scene just prior to our arrival. The suspect involved in this tragic incident is identified as Daryl E. Brooks, male 39 years of age, who is a resident of the city of Milwaukee. At this time, the Waukesha Police Department is referring five counts of first degree intentional homicide with additional uh, charges based on the investigation, but those will come in time. Social media footage showed the vehicle breaking through barriers and speeding into the road where the parade was taking place. Shocked by the incident, people, including families and children, fled for their lives as the car sped off, knocking down dozens of people. U.S. President Joe Biden nominated Jerome Powell as chair of the U.S. Federal Reserve for a second term. Jerome Powell was initially appointed by former President Donald Trump in 2018 and is now set to stay in the role for other four years. Powell's management of the economy during the pandemic gained lots of praise. However, he was criticized for not being or doing enough to tackle climate change and poverty and say he has weakened regulation of financial institutions. Nabi Khazini. I'm nominating Jerome Powell for a second term as chair of the Federal Reserve. U.S. President Joe Biden nominated Jerome Powell to serve a second term as Federal Reserve chair. The decision comes while challenges emerge after a long economic stagnation because of the corona pandemic. Joe Biden is seen to prefer continuity and bipartisanship at a time when surging inflation is burdening households. The executive branch praised Powell's decisions actions in lessening the economic impact brought on by the pandemic as well as the creation of 5.6 million jobs and a 4.6 unemployment rate. Because it's the Fed's job to balance two key goals. The first is to achieve maximum employment, to get as many American worker, Americas working, working as possible. And the second is to keep inflation low and stable. To meet these goals is going to require patience, skill, and independence. Powell, a Republican who was initially appointed by President Donald Trump in 2018, will be in office for his second term in February of the next year. Powell will be facing a difficult and a high-risk balancing act. Inflation has reached a three-decade high, causing hardship for millions of families, clouding the recovery and undercutting the Fed's mandate to keep prices stable. Further appointments will take place as Biden did not assign anyone for the handful of vacant spots in the Fed board, including Vice Chair for Supervision, which is responsible for banking regulation. The White House announced those appointments would begin in early December. Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan announced he will of his country to pledge around $28 million of aid in addition to humanitarian assistance for the benefits of Afghanistan, as stated by Pakistani Prime Minister's office, a list of supplies and commodities are being prepared to be sent to Afghan lands. Ayati Usama. According to the last statements of Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan, Humanitarian support and aid that reached roughly $28.4 million are to be sent to Afghanistan by Pakistani government. The humanitarian assistance goes in form of winter shelter, emergency medical supplies and food commodities including 50,000 tons of wheat. The Pakistani Prime Minister announced that the shipment of his country's aid has to be immediate as he met with the Army Chief General Kamar Javid Bajwa and other high countries officials, including the foreign minister. On the same announcement, Imran Khan stated that he permitted the Indian food aid for Afghanistan to go through the territories of his country heading to Afghanistan. The series of aid by Pakistani government included also a reduction in tariffs and sales tax for some Afghan products exported to Pakistan, as well as facilitating the return of some Afghan nationals seeking medical care in India.
On the counterpart, a delegation of Afghan health officials is to visit the Pakistani capital city, Islamabad, for talks concerning the humanitarian aid. As stated by Khan, Pakistani government had to have rounds of talks with Taliban government to find the easiest manner to facilitate the aid arrival as soon as possible, as he hoped to find convenient solutions to liquidity issues in Afghan banks to enable the latter to solve the economic changes. Former South Korean President Chan Doo Hwan, remembered as a dictator whose path to power was paved by a presidential assassination and military coup, died at the age of 90. Let's follow this report by Marwa Belaywar. At the age of 90, Chan Doo Hwan, the former South Korean military strongman who took power in a 1979 coup and brutally suppressed pro-democracy protests before being imprisoned for misdeeds in office, passed away. After years of authoritarian rule, Chan Doo Hwan permitted some liberalization. Under public pressure, he agreed to the nation's first direct and free election in history after hundreds of pro-democracy protesters were killed and tens of thousands were imprisoned during his presidency in the 90s 80s. During Chan's presidency, South Korea's economy grew rapidly. The country also hosted the 1986 Asian Games and was awarded the rights to host the 1988 Summer Olympics, which began after he left office. Chan implemented a range of liberalizing measures, including the repeal of a curfew imposed during the Korean War and the relaxation of regulations on trips abroad. He reportedly dropped plans to develop atomic bombs and longer-range missiles in an attempt to gain Washington's support for his military-backed government. On the other hand, during Chan's reign, North Korea repeatedly challenged South Korea. During a visit to Myanmar in 1983, North Korean commandos launched a bomb attack on Chan. He narrowly avoided being injured in the attack, which killed 21 people, including several South Korean government ministers. Since resigning in 1988, Chan sought asylum in a Buddhist temple for two years before being arrested. He was found guilty of corruption, rebellion and treason and condemned to death. Yet he was pardoned in 1997 in a bid for national reconciliation. Before his release, the court ordered him to pay back $119 million he had amassed in a slush fund during his rule. According to emergency officials and police who were dispatched to his sole home, Chan died at his home due to a cardiac arrest. And finally, for more international news, let's follow these briefs by Islam Seed. Following a police operation, at least eight dead were discovered on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro. Following a gun battle with police, bodies were discovered in mangrove swamp outside of the city, in Brazil, with several showing signs of torture. The bodies were all tossed into the mangrove swamp, according to witnesses who declined to be identified. They threw one after the other. All the indicators point to slaughter here. At least 12 people were killed by armed rebels in an attack on displayed civilians in the Democratic Republic of Congo's northeastern Italy on Sunday night, when fighters from the Cooperative for the Development of the Congo group raided the village of Drodo, killing six children, four men and two women. Koriko spokesman Patrick Bassa on the other side denied the group had slain civilians and stated that the fighters had engaged with the Hema militia near Drodo, but that the people had already departed the region. NASA is preparing to launch spacecraft to see if it can redirect a double asteroid redirection test mission, which is set to launch on Tuesday, and attempts to deflect an asteroid away from a possibly catastrophic impact with Earth. Although the asteroid poses no harm to the globe, scientists such as Stephen Hawking have classified impact events as one of the humanity's greatest hazards. In space access facility at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, the spacecraft is joined to its payload adapter before taking off. It will be launched on the top of a Falcon 9 rocket. 
unprecedented rains and floods led Bengaluru state to raise concern as lakes and tanks overflowed in the city to transform the city into streams. Emergency services in the area urged tractors and boats to be in action for the service of the city. These unseasonal rains of two weeks in the South Karnataka city left 24 deaths, according to state disaster authorities official, in addition to transforming the city to a lake-like area. That's all for this hour. The news continues on All24 News. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.